autobiography is mostly in historical uh, demography. And one of the things I studied was the response of demographic variables to uh, economic shocks and to epidemics and such things. Well, that was a long time ago. And so I was really excited and pleased when I got an email a couple of months ago uh, asking whether I would uh, participate in a United Nations expert group meeting on fertility and COVID-19 and how the UN should uh, adjust its population projections to take into account um, the impact of COVID on fertility. Now, uh, there's been a lot of speculation at, at dinner parties. Uh, I often hear people saying, oh, fertility is going to go up because people were confined home and they'll have so much more chance for sex and little else and uh, so on. Uh, there's that view and then there's the opposite view. Um, but uh, looking at historical data, we can see what happened in the past and perhaps learn something useful about the future. So, okay. And that was the focus of the whole expert meeting. And I unfortunately couldn't stay to the rest of it. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what was uh, said. Um, but here we go. Ron, you suddenly become very so, quiet. Uh, is this better? Yes, it's better. I'll try to, I'll try to restrain myself from wobbling my head around too much. Um, so, in fact, um, now there have been some articles, and we have a human fertility database, which gives us short run fluctuations and so on. And now uh, it's clear that COVID-19, in fact, led to sharp declines in fertility and in births, at least in higher income countries with better data systems. And there's expectation that the fertility declines will be bigger and deeper in the current year, 2021. So here are a couple of the studies. Um, and in January of 2021, the declines that have been reported uh, range from zero in some countries. I think the Scandinavian countries, for example, have very little uh, impact, if any. Uh, down to a 20% decline, I think, in Spain, perhaps. So substantial. Those are big declines. Um, and we look at the US, there have been some surveys that have reported that uh, intended births are postponed, that people are intentionally postponing births they intended to have, say, this year. Um, and coital frequency went down rather than up during the period in which we were in lockdown. And also that there's been some decline in desired number. I think most of the impact is coming. Uh, in California, there was an article in the Chronicle um, a week or two ago that said, uh, birth registration show a 10 to 15% decline in January and February relative to 2020. Uh, so that's a pretty big decline right on our doorstep. And Kearney and Levine, who did an early article and then they updated it uh, in, in December, I think that was a King's paper, um, their best guess now is that there'll be a deficit of something like 300,000 
births in 2021 in the US due to COVID? Well, they're ordinarily, um, let's see, I think about 3.8 million births there were in 2019 before COVID. So 300, uh, well, I say here about a 10% reduction, maybe it's a little bit uh, less than that. Okay. So what should we expect then going forward and what can we learn looking back at the economic demographic crisis in the past. Uh, economic and demographic because the COVID crisis is really two crises. One is uh, a crisis of health and mortality, and the other is a crisis of the economy, high unemployment, and so on. Uh, so in historical data, historical studies, we can look at both kinds of crises. Um, on the one hand, we have plenty of epidemics to examine. And on the other hand, uh, well, I don't think there's great data on the macroeconomy or unemployment. Uh, we do have a ton of data on food prices and quite a bit of data on nominal wages. So we can look at things like real wages or uh, grain price fluctuations and so on. Now, so let's, before we start looking at the results of those analyses, let's just think a moment about what we might expect. Um, and in particular, might we expect, uh, what timing would we expect and might we expect a rebound above normal uh, after the crisis? And, First, let's think about a natural fertility population that is a population in which people do not have intention for total numbers of births and for the most part aren't contracepting. Well, in the crisis year, which I'll call year zero throughout, uh, fewer women than usual conceive for one reason uh, or another. So even in the crisis year itself, births will probably be somewhat low than those, you know, in principle, there's a nine month uh, lag between conception and birth. Now in the next year, in year one, because fewer women than usual conceived the year before, there could be fewer births. So that would be 2021, that's our year one. Uh, so births are going to be lower, but also in year one, there are fewer women who are pregnant, who are in postpartum amenorrhea, or who are breastfeeding. So there are going to be more women at risk of conceiving. And so conception, births are going to be lower in year one, but conceptions are going to be higher. And then in year two, because conceptions were higher in year one than normal, there are going to be extra births because those extra con conceptions produce extra births. And then in addition, we have all the women who would ordinarily have been giving birth in year two. So in year two, we expect births to rise above their normal level, that is rebound above ordinary levels of, of fertility. And in the next year, there are going to be more women than usual who are not at risk of conceiving uh, because they're breastfeeding, they're in postpartum amenorrhea, uh, there are fewer who have two-year closed birth intervals, so they're ready to conceive and have one birth the next year and so on. So in year three, births are going to be low and then this kind of pattern continues in a cyclic way, but diminishing cycles. And the length of these cycles is approximately equal to the average uh, closed interval uh, 
birth interval length or about three years, maybe third months in pre-industrial Europe. Um, okay, so that's the, that's what we might expect just thinking about the demography. And I'm going to come back to that later. <coughs> but, um, now let's think about the same kind of thing in contracepting society and a society like the US today, say. Um, again, we're going to have fewer births uh, in year zero. Um, again, those who, so they'll be, sorry, there'll be fewer conceptions in year zero, so there'll be fewer births in year one, but those who postponed in year zero are going to uh, want to conceive in year one, and so uh, you, you play through this and you come out with a very similar story about what the pattern over time of fluctuations is going to be, assuming that people are aiming for something like three-year birth intervals, which I think they generally are. Uh, okay, so that's a little background on what we might expect in terms of these fluctuations. Now, what do we have to work with in the historical uh, materials? Well, first of all, we usually don't have denominators, at least in, in pre-industrial Europe. What we mostly have is numbers of births and deaths. There may be great temporal detail. We'll be able to get birth and deaths by day, uh, for example, but we are typically not going to have uh, you know, no, no, what age woman they occur and, and so on. So we're going to be analyzing fluctuations in births and deaths and pain prices. Now, that might seem like a hazardous business to a demographer who's used to thinking about age-specific fertility, age-specific mortality, uh, and with an appreciation of the importance of age in these demographic processes. Well, I did a lot of methodological work then back in those days to explore uh, what you could do with data of, of this kind. And I showed uh, that uh, for short run fluctuations, there's hardly any difference between just using the numbers of births and deaths uh, relative to their trend and looking at a variable like total fertility rate or life expectancy. Um, and that involved writing out the demographic processes uh, sort of explicitly as time series with age distributions and then examining the implications in the frequency domain as opposed to the time domain. In the frequency domain, you can separate out uh, across short run fluctuations, uh, medium run fluctuations, long run fluctuations. And what you can see is that there's a very high correlation between variable like co-fertility rate and births when you're looking at short run fluctuations, even if there is very uh, poor correlation for longer term fluctuations. Ron, is there an easy so, way to explain uh, to to us what the difference between the time domain and the frequency domain is, or is that a long discussion? If we've never heard that distinction well, before, is I'm it possible? Well, I may come back to that at the end, but uh, well, I'll say a word about it. Um, I think the first demographer who thought about population dynamics uh, this way was uh, Ansley Cole. Um, I sort of was independently arriving at this approach, having learned frequency domain methods in econometrics as a graduate student. Um, frequency domain methods are 
you know, it's, it's sort of analogous to an ordinary time domain regression of the sort you're accustomed to, uh, except now you have, what can I say? First thing I should say is you don't need to have any kind of cycles in, in the data or regular fluctuations or anything. Any, uh, any time series can be viewed from frequency perspective uh, and the variance in that series is then decomposed into uh, variances Let's, instead of talking about periods and cycles, we can just talk as I was about long run and short run. So if you have a, a time series that's bouncing up and down like this, that's high frequency variation. That's a little bit like, um, a, like business cycles or maybe business cycles you'd think of as medium term variations. Trends would be infinitely long, uh, cycles, very long run changes. I think I'm not going to talk more about that yet, but uh, come back to it a little bit later. Um, okay, so the data themselves are coming from European parish registers. Um, and in England, for example, what I'm going to be looking at more closely, um, the parish registers were by law, um, kept starting in 1538 and then probably continue up to this day. But uh, vital registration started, I think, around 1840. So between 1538 and 1840, say for about three centuries, um, you have these uh, parish register data. And there was a big project that uh, a famous undertaking by uh, Tony Wrigley and Roger Schofield and collaborators in England, in which many local amateur historians collected these data and um, and then they were combined. And so kind of nationally uh, representative non-random sample of parish register results. Um, and so those are the raw materials and those are available um, some of the time I'll be analyzing those monthly, the monthly data, sometimes annually. And then economic historians have been gathering grain price data, and waste data, and so on for, well, a very long time. Um, now, I'm also going to talk about analyses for developing countries and their Latin American countries, they're also often parish register data. Uh, the Philippines have parish register data. Some parts of Africa uh, have some parish register data that can be used in the same way. Uh, but then in the, in the 20th century, many places have vital registration data also. It may be a very poor quality, but uh, if, say, under registration is common and not varying too much over time, it doesn't really matter much. Uh, if the vital registration quality or parish registration data, you know, if the, if the quality is correlated with the occurrence of crises, then you're in trouble. But if it's independent, then it doesn't matter so much. And then for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, mostly um, data from demographic and health surveys was used. I didn't believe this would be possible myself, but uh, Andy Foster showed it was possible to actually do this kind of analysis using DHS data from Sub-Saharan Africa. That's relying on retrospective reporting of earlier births and deaths on the part of uh, survey respondents. So you have short series of uncertain quality. I just didn't think it would be possible, but lo and behold. Okay. Now, the methods, well, this work was done quite a while ago. The methods are somewhat uh, old fashioned, I guess, but they hold up uh, very well, I think. The results hold up very well uh, under um, more recent methods. Um, 
Dr. Oliver Grebhorn theory through such things. And I think the ones I'm going to be showing are very transparent and visually striking. So uh, the, the series are all first um, divided by a moving average of themselves. Uh, this is just a nine year moving average. Um, and the effect of that is to remove all longer term and uh, even longer medium term trends in the data um, because they're going to be just fluctuating around one. Uh, so that's the way the data are first transformed. <clears throat> and then I'm estimating distributed lag models. Uh, that means we're looking at, say, uh, birth today as a function of shocks today, a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, and so on, up to, in this case, 34 months ago, I think roughly three years of monthly data, for example. Uh, and what I'm going to be showing is plots of the estimated coefficients from doing that. And you can think of those estimated coefficients as tracing out the response of, in this case, uh, fertility to a shock, either an epidemic type shock or a food price type shock, uh, parceling out everything else. It'll be clearer when you see these, I think. And, and then there's the question of trying to figure out causality, or what, what's going on, how do we interpret these coefficients? And here, um, I think also formal demography is very important. Um, so for example, if you see a response of births, or I would interpret that as fertility, uh, it was very common to say, ah, that's because uh, in the crisis, marriages went down. And indeed, you find a very strong correlation between uh, marriage rates and birth rates in the historical data. But if you do a little demographic exploration, you can quickly discover that no, that couldn't possibly be the reason that births are going down because marriages are going down. Uh, in fact, you know, you just do a little analysis using uh, data you can get from other sources on birth rates by duration of marriage, and you can see what kind of fluctuations you would expect in births as a result of the observed fluctuations in marriages. And you can quickly see that the, those uh, implied fluctuations would be way too small. And so I put a, an article I did which will also then introduce you to time to the frequency domain approach I put on online on the on this on the web for the website for the workshop uh, the sexual analysis of births and marriage and something like that um, now another possibility is that uh, the reason that births go down is because Pregnant women are dying or reproductive age women are dying. Uh, and so there just aren't as many uh, reproductive age women to give birth. Uh, but again, you can quickly convince yourself, you can quickly realize that that effect is way too small to produce such big fluctuations. And so in fact, the variations in fertility then, as I would say today, are almost certainly due to conscious, uh, well, possibly to conscious uh, behavior to postpone conceptions or to abort uh, pregnancies, or perhaps more likely uh, stress-related reductions in coital frequency, um, or perhaps health-related uh, impacts on fertility since a vastly greater uh, number of women and men were, uh, were sick than were dying for the most part. Okay, 
So when we go, let's look at some actual estimates now. So for the monthly stuff, I'm going to show you first, we have 3,444 months. That's a lot of, that's a long time series. Uh, so some of the analysis I'm going to show a month of data and some of it is for annual data. All right. And then I'm later going to show you that these results generalize quite well to other parts of Europe and to many developing countries. Okay. Got this annoying. Ron, we can't hear you. Are you speaking? Um, yeah, I'm just mumbling to myself because I oh. a, the video faces was in the middle of what I wanted to talk about here. Okay. So you see here on the right. Can you use your uh, mouse, Ron? Can you point uh, to us? Yes. Uh, okay. So here we have the coefficients. Uh, estimated for effects at various months following the shock. Here is month zero. There's a positive association. Here we're looking at fertility in relation to mortality or births in relation to deaths, short on fluctuations. Um, these are different lags from zero up to 34 months. And we first see this uh, and I should say on the vertical axis, what we have is elasticities, proportional change in Y uh, associated with proportional change in X. So first there is this counterintuitive positive coefficient here. <clears throat> well, that's Ritter's causality. Uh, what that is, is that if there's for any reason unusually high number of births, there's going to be a high number of neonatal deaths and in the same month. And so here the causality is going from exogenous fluctuations in, uh, in births to deaths rather than from fluctuations in health and mortality, fertility. So uh, we can investigate that by looking at neonatal mortality rates taken from other sources. And yes, indeed, we can confirm that that's about the right uh, size association. For the most part, what we're seeing is these, these negative coefficients, at least for the first 12 months. Um, now, one important question, which I don't know the answer, is why births start declining so soon after the mortality crisis. Here we are one month after the crisis, two, three, four months. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a mystery. It could be fetal mortality. It could be um, you know, intentional abortion. It could possibly be migration of people away from this area. Um, or it could possibly be a breakdown in registration, but unclear. Um, now, however, in nine months, you get a very clear, uh, very sharp reduction in uh, fertility. And by 10 months, that is still there, but it's declining at 11 months, that has turned positive. And you see the, there's a positive rebound above the normal that persists for uh, another two years. So uh, what is that due to? Well, it could be reduced coital frequency because of the horror of the epidemic or whatever. It could be um, stress-induced fetal loss. Uh, Now, 
we can also do the same kind of analysis using annual data, using the same data. Uh, the annual data, well, you can define the year however you like. For this kind of work, ordinarily the harvest year is used in pre-industrial England. That was Michaelmas to Michaelmas, which is basically October, you know, a year starting in October when the harvest is brought in and you see what you've got. Um, now, depending on when during the 12 months of a year, um, the mortality shocks generally occur. There may be up to 12 months for the repercussions to emerge during that same calendar year or yeah, or uh, if, it, if the shock comes close to the end of the year, then most of the repercussions are going to show up in the next year. And so if you know something about timing of the shocks, well, you can, or if you want to assume that they're randomly distributed across the year, you can go back to that monthly um, regression and you can calculate a suitable average across the different months shown there to see if this is consistent with the annual data. And in fact, I found it was uh, quite consistent with the annual data. So again here, you find uh, a shock at year zero, maybe a little bigger than you would expect, a uh, shock the next year. And then two years afterwards, you find a positive rebound. Three years after, it drops down again below zero again. In the fourth year, uh, it's almost back to normal. And so this is the picture of damped oscillations that I was uh, talking about before. Okay, so that's looking at responses to mortality shocks. And I see time is fast. fast. Okay, I better speed up. Um, now, the um, mortality shock, sorry, the price shock here is food price. And again, the, the picture is, is very similar. Then you see an early response, earlier than expected to the price shock. It's not, it doesn't wait nine months to start. I won't discuss that puzzle again. And you see a rebound above normal uh, two years, uh, 24 months after the shock, and then going negative again, and so on. Again, we can look at an annual version of this regression, and that looks like this. Be similar to the response to a mortality shock. Um, again, you see these damped oscillations. Okay. Now, you might wonder, uh, COVID-19 is a big economic shock and a big health shock. Uh, how does it compare to these things we've been looking at historically? Well, it's useful, I think, instead of just assuming there's a linearity in the response to fluctuation in mortality or in uh, prices, here, the deviations from uh, trend in mortality have been categorized into very low, low, high, very high, and extremely high. And these are arranged on the uh, horizontal axis according to the mean values in each of those categories. And you can see, and then I've summed all the coefficients from the annual regression. So if we look at the five years sums, which gives us the total effect of the pluses and minuses, uh, we can add them all up and we plot them against the size of the deviation in mortality. You can see it's really amazingly linear. I find that uh, amazing. So um, I was very surprised to see this. I thought it would be not. And the timing is somewhat nonlinear, but the total effect is very linear. Um, so, now US COVID deaths are about 20%. That's 0.2 on this uh, horizontal axis. 
because we've had about 600,000 deaths with a normal number of deaths of 3 million. So we've got about 20% extra deaths. And we can then say, well, then how many, what birth deficit would we expect if this were similar? Well, the coefficient here is about point minus 0.075. The normal number of births in the US 2019, 3,750,000, three multiply those out and you get about 280,000 fewer births. Well, that is pretty damn close to the 300,000 that that earlier article I mentioned was predicting for the birth deficit in the US. Uh, well, that closeness of agreement is partly coincident, I'm sure, but still, uh, we're on the same page here. Okay. Now, other countries. Ron, we should probably um, be wrapping up uh, about two more minutes. Can I give you about two more minutes? Okay. Okay, so if you sum all those positive and negative coefficients, you find the total net, net effect. Um, here is pre-industrial Europe, 14 countries. This is response to price uh, fluctuation. That's expressed as real income, so the sign has changed. In pre-industrial Europe, the cumulative elasticity is 0.12. Uh, if we look at it for England, it was 0.14. So England, what we've been looking at is kind of typical for pre-industrial Europe. For Asia, this would be mostly 20th century, 0.26. Latin America, 0.31. Sub-Saharan Africa, 0.32. Remarkably, remarkable agreement. And if you look at the response with mortality to uh, positive income shocks, again, in the developing countries, they're pretty, uh, pretty similar. So uh, now if we look at the timing, this is showing, these are, these are medians over lots of country estimates, but you see here uh, the European fertility timing pattern, which is similar to what we've seen for pre-industrial uh, England. And here we have the developing countries uh, it looks kind of similar, but more exaggerated. If you divide this pattern by the cumulative sum to kind of standardize, you get this, this right-hand panel, and you can see how similar this pattern across time is in developing countries and, and pre-industrial Europe. Um, if you look at the 1918 influenza epic pandemic, now here we're not looking at regression coefficients, we're looking at the actual series of births and deaths, which I've expressed here as ratios to their average value, 1915 to 1925. You see, uh, this is the deaths, about 30% higher than normal. And uh, here you see the pattern of births unfolding in historical time. This, as I say, not regression coefficients. And you see this dip followed by above and then down below. Uh, so I'm just about done here. Um, well, Spain, France today, big dips you see. Finland, you had a bit of a rebound that shows already. This is the US. Uh, the last thing I want to show is, uh, well, implication of forecasting fertility. My view is ignore the period in which we have information on COVID fertility, base forecasts on data through 2019 and trends that are observed over that period. This other stuff is only going to uh, confuse and, and mislead you, um, unless, of course, you have other evidence other than simple time series stuff. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. You might Thanks look so at the much, rest Ron. of this PowerPoint. Yeah. Thanks so much. So Elizabeth is going to lead the discussion. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your uh, hand or type something in chat.
We did have an earlier question that Ron could maybe speak to, um, asking about which subpopulations might have higher or lower fertility during uh, this time period, and are there any projections to be made about social impacts longer term tied to the heterogeneity um, of those subpopulations? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, there wasn't anything in what I did that addressed that, but we had a dissertation uh, in the demography department by Patrick Galloway and uh, very interesting papers that came out of that. He looked in great, so a lot of what I presented on pre industrial Europe was in his work. I believe he won the uh, Dorothy Swain Thomas Award for one of those papers. And he looked, at, first of all, he could show that across European countries, the ones with lower uh, per capita incomes had stronger uh, responses of both fertility and mortality. Um, and he also, as I recall, I think looked, uh, or perhaps this was Tommy Bengtsson, looked within Sweden at parishes or groups of parishes with lower income compared to higher income. And uh, again, saw that same thing, lower income uh, populations have a stronger response. And then there was a book published uh, out of what was called the Eurasian Project uh, that compare, ha has comparative uh, analyses of the kind I've shown for historical China, Japan, Italy, Sweden, and Belgium, um, in which they have micro, they're looking at micro data at the parish level uh, in which they have data on maybe tax returns or something of the sort. And again, those are showing that it's poorer people who have the big responses for the most part. Uh, and I guess that is not so different from today. Okay, we have another question. Um, Jenna Nobles in her work on tsunami affected areas has shown that the fertility responses to mortality crises do not only happen at the individual level, but there are also community level responses to these crises, crises that is uh, pronatalist effects. Um, I wonder if something like this is also relevant for COVID. Can we expect any community level response to COVID? By community level response would be meant that those who do not themselves experience COVID directly in the sense of getting sick will have fertility responses. Would that be accurate or is that not what's meant by community level response? In any event, if that's what's uh, meant, I think certainly. Sorry, so maybe I, I can jump in just to clarify. Um, yeah, so the idea is that even those who are not affected by the crisis will would have some response. Like, for example, if there's like a general idea that like fertility is falling too much, then like we need to do something to kind of catch up. Uh, okay. So to... Yes, I'm not familiar with Jenna and Noble's work on this. Um, so that sounds like a sort of, uh, yeah, community response in the sense that people are thinking about the good of the community, the good of the population, rather than their own individual well being or something like that. Uh, I don't know any evidence of that historically. And do I expect that from COVID? No, I'd say I, I don't. But uh, if I had to give a reason, it would be no better than the reasons you all might have for whatever you think. So I don't have a good answer to that question. I guess it's a short can, can I just make a, a brief comment is that it's, um, it might, if one didn't see the kind of cycles that Ron was showing, you might confuse uh, this rebound with some kind of aggregate effect. Uh, so when, in an analysis, you would want to disentangle uh, 
the two. Thank you. That's a good point. I mean, what Ron's talking about, I believe, is a very individual level effect. It's of the woman being pregnant or not pregnant and having exposure or not, uh, which creates its own time uh, kind of uh, effect. Great. Well, have... yes, but I'm also imagining people overwhelmed by the stress, shock, risk, deaths of people that know things like that. So that even those who, in, in terms of these historical epidemics, weren't, um, their health wasn't directly impacted, may have reduce vital frequency, may have said, oh, this is a lousy time to give birth, and so on and so forth. So I'm imagining the response is greater than just those who are directly affected. But I agree entirely what, uh, with what you're saying. Yes, my concern is that the UN in doing their population projections would say, oh, look at that, fertility has rebounded above normal. Uh, we'd better project a higher fertility than, than normal. And I think that would be a mistake. I think the best thing is just to ignore the experience of the COVID year and 2021 and 2022 and just uh, pretend you didn't know anything about them and forecast based on what came before. Elizabeth, I think I'm gonna, um, we're getting, of course, as we're nearing our hour of ending, we're getting lots of great questions. I hate to cut things off, but I think we really should take a break before the next session. Ron, um, if you wanna stay on and answer questions in chat, you're welcome to, or you're also uh, welcome to just call it a day and, 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 and we really appreciate your intervention. If everybody could turn off their mute and show their faces so we can make as heartfelt a response as of thanks to Ron as possible. Uh, thanks so much. Terrific. And um, we look forward to seeing you uh, in our capstone uh, discussion at the end of the day, Ron. Okay, great. And um, I'll say on chat, I see there are lots of chats here uh, for a while. All right.